What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. John Corcoran here. I am the host of the Smart Business Revolution podcast. This is a live episode. We're live on LinkedIn Live every week, and I'm here with Steve Fretzen. Steve? Dr. Jeremy <laughs> Weiss, also. <laughs> Dr. Jeremy Weiss. Jeremy? Yeah, keep going. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, host of the Inspired Insider podcast. Check it out. It's a great podcast. And Steve. Yeah, this is going to go on my podcast too, John. So uh, this will go on Smart Business Revolution, which I, I recommend people, you know, just mass consuming and binge listening to John's interviews. They're really good. And also check out Inspired Insider. I like to give a favorite. Uh, um, Nolan Bushnell, uh, who is the founder of Atari, who was Steve Jobs' mentor, talks about when Steve Jobs um, offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. So he talks about that. So you could check out that episode. That's a great so episode. Keep, Definitely anyway. have to go check that out. Yeah. So, um, well, we're, I'm excited because this episode is something that a lot of people care about and struggle with, and that is how to sell without being salesy, how to sell without... Uh, making you feel com- uncomfortable or, or make your, your potential client feel or customer feel uncomfortable. And we've got Steve Fretzen with us, who's an expert who's going to be talking about that. First, of course, before we get to that, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 Media, which helps B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and Content Marketing. You're listening to a podcast right now or watching it live, and this is one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Just so many great relationships have come from it. So if you are thinking about doing a podcast and as you have a B2B business, give us a call, drop us a line, email support at Rise25Media or connect with us at Rise25Media.com or on LinkedIn. Uh, so Steve, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Uh, we've done uh, other episodes together, other interviews together. But for those who don't know you, what you do, you specialize in helping attorneys. That's my background, practicing law. But you have also written three books about sales and selling. So tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a business development coach for the last 20 years. And in 2008, when the recession hit, I found a niche working with attorneys because they really hate sales, number one. And number two is they're not really trained to do anything around client development at law school or at the law firm level. So there was just such a need in this industry that I went from working really with everyone to really focusing on a niche myself of you know, working with attorneys and helping them grow their law practices. And it's been an unbelievable journey. I work with some of the best people in the world, uh, people that you would know, John. Yeah. And, you know, we can dive into that. A lot of attorneys struggle with sales uh, for many different reasons. But let's talk about sales overall, you know, and how buyers have changed. There's been a lot of books. I've, I've read a number of the books out there um, about how sales and selling have changed. Um, we've got, you got, uh, buyers are really well educated these days because they can do a lot of research. Whereas 20 years ago, there wasn't as much information out there. So that's one of the ways in which it's changed. But how has the market changed for buyers uh, even before COVID happened? Yeah. I mean, everybody that's listening is a buyer. We all buy things. You know, we buy, you know, homes, we buy cars, we buy services, we buy a lawyer, we buy an accountant. We we're buying things all the time. And as buyers, we've gotten more sophisticated, not only in getting to what we want, which is really about information and price. That's what we're driven to find, to get. And the other thing that we're driven towards is keeping the whoever the salesperson is, whether they're title a salesperson or they're a CPA, it doesn't matter. They're selling a service, how to keep them at bay, how to keep them you know, a distance from us so we don't get caught. We don't get sold something we don't need. We don't get taken for a ride. We don't uh, make a bad decision. We're all afraid of that. We're all risk averse in some ways, which is why we've learned to sort of not get burned. And the easiest example is the social proof that we need to go to a restaurant. If I'm going to go to a new restaurant, I want to go and I want to see on Yelp. I want to see on Urban Spoon. I want to see on all the different outlets that this is the place to eat. This is the great service, great food. 
Otherwise, I'm just not interested in, in trying something and rolling the dice. And this is how as buyers, we've evolved to really drive to get information and price before we make decisions, which makes sense. That's what a smart consumer will do. But in that happening, what's what's going on with the sales professionals, with the people that sell services and products and things like that, they're basically just getting strung along. They're just getting taken for a ride. They're they're being very reactive in the way that they're managing this situation. And they end up not really allowing for a win-win to occur. You know, the seller's out to sell and the buyer's out to buy, and they're not really connected or or working in a collaborative way. And that's hurting everybody. And I've got obviously some backup and stories I can give you, but that's the gist of what it is. And just the model of the tradition of traditionally how people sell and push products and services does not gist or gel well with the way people buy things. I want to hear, Steve, you know, what are attorneys experiencing when they come to you? And again, like I say, attorneys, we could probably put anything in there, right? doctors, sure. people who sell products. What are exper attorneys experiencing when they come to you? What are they saying? Here's what I my pain is. And then I'd love to hear a bit about your process, what you walk them through. Well, and so the interesting thing is I have to follow my process sort of to a T because if I'm training and teaching people my process, but then I'm not using it myself, then I'm totally. a bunch, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. <laughs> so I have to be very right. careful to not slip into some of my old bad habits from when I was, you know, in sales, you know, for many, many years where I have to really uh, follow my process. So they're coming to me on a number of levels. Um, most importantly is thinking about things from the very beginning. They don't have a plan. They don't have goals set. They're all over the place because they're just thinking, I have to get out there and get business. Okay. Right. And it's hard. And how many hours do they invest in maybe an ineffective way uh, to get that business? And my, one of my clients calls it sheer effort of force. Yeah. And that's how he spends his time or used to spend his time going after business because that's the way it's done. You just have to go invest a ton of time doing as much as you can and then hoping that something comes out of that effort. And it's incredibly inefficient and it's really not a great way to spend your time. And lawyers, as you may know, are based on their billable hour. They're, they're literally time is money, you know, not figuratively, literally it is. So the idea that they're going to go spend two, three, four, five hundred 500 hours a year on business development and not get the return, not get the, the growth is, is, is very, very disheartening, very challenging. So they're coming to me with with lack of plan, lack of understanding of how to actually go out and get it, to find it, to and then then once you do find an app, let's say you get in front of a decision maker at a at a major corporation, how to run that meeting so that you don't end up doing a sales pitch or doing a, a trying to convince someone of something. How do we use what I call this sales free selling model to walk a buyer through a buying decision to make sure it's a good fit versus trying to jam a round peg in a square hole. Okay, great. So can you take us through kind of what a process would be like then? And and how does, particularly for lawyers, but more broadly, any you know, anyone who's in professional services who's selling something and could be at risk of being a commodity, um, how do you take control of that process when someone calls you, you know, interested in your services? Yeah. And so that's the goal of the buyer is to take control, ask the questions and get that information and price. So the process that I teach every day, and again, doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you follow these steps and execute on it the right way, you're going to come to one of two conclusions. Either this person is exactly who you should be working with. They fall in love with you. You fall in love with them. Everything aligns with the stars and you move forward. Or this is the side perk or benefit is by controlling the meeting soup to nuts, you identify who's not a good fit, who doesn't have the money to pay you, who's not really going to be cooperative, who's not going to follow through. And you might be in a position to move them to a no, which then gets you your time back. You're not playing the game of chasing uh, you know, everyone that comes your way, hoping that they're going to sign. I want to know what's going on, not hope or wonder what's going on. And so the process I teach, and it's just follow these steps and get a predictable outcome. And that's what people need, but don't have. And it's, I can tell their frustration when they call me that they feel they're just, they're just out there just running on a wheel like a hamster. Yeah. So what are a few examples of a step that you would, you know, walk someone through? 
Yeah. And let me give you the first two steps because this is without the first two steps, everything that comes after it doesn't really matter. You're not going to really get the, get the buy-in and you're not going to get the control that you're looking for to run a meeting in a way that's going to get a win-win outcome. So the first step that I teach is relationship building. Okay. Now we go into meetings all the time and we just naturally build relationships and that's fine for some people, or maybe they could be doing better. And what I mean by that is there's a thing called observational relationship building. Now you guys are looking behind me and you're seeing a few things. You're seeing that I wrote a book. Okay. And you're seeing, I have an autographed Michael Jordan Jersey. So how easy is it for you? If you want to build a relationship with me to mention those two things, very easy because it's right there. What I'm teaching is lawyers or anyone to go out and, and, and go online, get the research, find the things that are interesting about that person that you could bring up to them because that's going to be what they want to talk about. So Jeremy listens to my podcast, be that lawyer. He identifies a, a line uh, that was said by me that he really connected with him. And he brings that line up to me at the very beginning of sales, meeting. free selling sales. I love free that sell. line. Yeah, That's yeah. it. That's it. All yeah. right. So there you go. And in doing so, you've just made a friend. You've just, I, you've just made my heart sing because now we're talking about something that's valuable to me. That's important to me. That means something to me. It wasn't the weather, the traffic or the Michael Jordan Jersey. And so I'm teaching people how to build natural affinities and how to leverage relationship. And the easiest way to sort of explain this is imagine a skyscraper, right? A hundred stories up. And as an architect, I say, you know, the fastest way to build this skyscraper is to let's just start on the 50th floor. Now, how fast am I going to lose my job? Okay. <laughs> Probably pretty quickly. So what does a skyscraper need? It needs the piers in the ground. It needs the, it needs the foundation, and people are charging into these meetings without really spending five or 10 minutes building a strong relationship. And that ends up being the foundation of trust and likability and common ground for the rest of the engagement. So that's the first step. And even if somebody says to me, let's say I'm meeting with, with a lawyer and the lawyer says to me, uh, hey, Steve, let's get right down to it. Tell me what you do. Tell me how you charge. Right. And I'm like, uh oh. This isn't following the relationship plan that I had in mind. But if I'm prepared, couldn't I say, absolutely, we're going to handle that. I'm going to tell you everything and more than you probably want to hear about me and what I do and my rates and everything. However, I have to mention, Jeremy, that I saw a recent uh, article that you posted on LinkedIn and I needed to just ask you a question about it. And then I do. And then we talk. And now we're building relationship. So I did a simple play of what I call agree and redirect to get you back on track of where I need you to be, which is talking about you, which is your favorite subject. And it's building a relationship between us. Okay. So Not that's jumping. the first one. So relationship. That's so, it. Relationship. Okay. You got to the start there. Step? The second step is, is super important. And um, it's really about setting an agenda. And while we think that sounds formal or that sounds uncomfortable or whatever, what I've experienced is that working with thousands of, of not only attorneys, but entrepreneurs, that if you set an agenda, you can use it as a way to take control of the meeting where it ends up as a win-win. Everybody feels good about it. Or you could not set an agenda and let the cards fall the way they fall. And that could be a great meeting. That could be a total disaster. Okay. So I have a very specific agenda that I've been using for years. And look, did I come up with agendas out of blue, out of the blue sky? No. Agendas have been around forever, but it's how I tweak and adjust and, and build the language around the agenda to get a desired outcome, which is control of the meeting. So that's really what I want to do. Now, I'm happy to either give you those steps or give you an example of how it works, if that would be helpful. But let me know where yeah, you want to yeah, go. Yeah, talk about an agenda. You know, I love that, Steve, because oftentimes if we, you know, people have a, we have a big meeting or someone has a big meeting, you set an agenda, but on a normal call, we don't. But what you're saying is you, you should always set an agenda. And then, and I could see that is, would be very beneficial. So what would yep. be an example? Yeah. So, that? so agendas can be set for any kind of meeting, but I'm talking about, let's say that, that, um, Jeremy, you're a potential client for me. You, you want to improve your sales or whatever. And so you we're meeting, we built this great relationship. And then I would say the following, and there's a bunch of steps that you got to kind of listen for and be cool. We'll role play this. Okay. Live in real time. And I just like you to be cooperative. Obviously you could be difficult, but that's not your style. You're, you're, you're a charming person. So exactly. stay, co stay cooperative. Cause I can tell you in the thousands and thousands of time that not only I've done this, but that my clients have done this. It's on one hand, how many times there's been any kind of pushback. 
the person goes along with it because it makes so much sense. So we've been talking about your podcast and I say, you know, Jeremy, we could probably talk about you know, how amazing your podcast is for hours. But listen, I know how valuable your time is and quite frankly, mine as well. And I thought just to make the best use of our time while we're together today, um, would it be all right just to set a little agenda for us? Is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, great. So I know we had agreed in our email for about a 45 minute call. We've got about 40 minutes left. And from my perspective, the, the, the purpose of us getting together was really just to get to know each other better and see if there's a fit. Okay. Does that sound about right for you? Yeah. Okay, great, great. So what I was hoping to do is spend some time asking you some questions, learning more about your business, and just try to, again, identify uh, what's going on. And I do tend to ask some tough questions. Is that going to be all right as well? Sure. As long and as just, we're live on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> and just out of curiosity, anything specific you want to make sure we get that you get out of the meeting today? Uh, yeah, I would just, I would love to hear obviously more about what you do, but it sounds that's in the agenda. So it is. And, and we'll probably handle that closer to the end of the meeting. And, and, and the other thing about the end of the meeting, if it's okay, uh, real quick, Jeremy, is that when I meet with people, typically one of a couple things happens. Either we decide it's a great fit, it's a great synergy, we want to talk about specific next steps to move forward, and we can agree on that at the end of the meeting. Or if for any reason you don't feel it's a fit or I don't feel it's it's a good fit, we can be very honest with each other and just call it a day. We can stay friends, but but it's okay to tell me no. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Is that all right as well? Sounds good. Okay. And scene. Okay. <laughs> so, so think about it in 90 seconds. I thought you were going to ask me tough questions that I was like, what? I don't know what he's going to ask me, but I'm okay. ready here. No. I'm, so I want, I want to just explain what, what yeah. just happened. Okay. In a 90 second agenda, we agreed on the time. So it's not going to go two hours if it does, if we don't want it to, and it's also not going to go 15 minutes. We agreed on the time. The purpose is to see if it's a fit, which puts us on a level playing field. Okay. Even if you're the big shot CEO and I'm a lowly salesperson, I want to be on the same level playing field. Okay. Either way, uh, you agreed to not only answer questions, but tough questions. I'm not asking you those questions now, but isn't that the goal of our meeting that I need to get into the weeds and understand what your problems are and how deep that rabbit hole goes? That's where the business is. That's what I need to know to understand if there is a fit. And you just agreed to allow me to ask those questions. Okay. And then think about the last step about the outcome. It's about moving someone forward to a specific next step or moving them to a no. And they're both great responses. And what we're leaving out of that is wondering, hoping, guessing. That's the killer of business and sales is wondering, hoping, guessing. Mm. I want to know at the end of every meeting, is it doing something or is it not and why? And so hope, while great in the movie Shawshank Redemption for Tim Robbins and his character, Andy Dufresne, okay, hope is a killer for us in business development, sales, whatever we want to call it. So our job is to make sure we get rid of hope, get rid of, of guessing and wondering and put some real honest truth into these meetings to understand what's really going on and try to identify lies or, or the reality of it. That's what that agenda does. You know, I want to ask you about, you know, we're recording this in January, 2021. We're, you know, a year into COVID. How has sales changed in the last year? For many people, it's become incredibly efficient in the sense that the travel, the time to run around, the lunches that had to happen, all of that stuff has gone to zero. So everything is being done by phone, by Zoom. And so for me, just as an example, as a, as a, as a hypothetical situation that's real, is I went from an average of about four meetings a day, which I consider to be an incredibly uh, efficient day and, and a powerful day to having somewhere between seven and nine meetings a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about with my clients, with my prospective clients, with strategic partners, podcasts, valuable meetings. Okay. And I think a lot of professionals out there are feeling the same thing. They've been able to cut back on expenses. They've been more efficient with their time. They're getting in front of more people. More people are willing to meet because it's not as involved as it was. Now, is it harder in some ways? Yes, I would prefer to see you two in person and shake your hands and buy you a steak and have a glass of wine. I mean, that's for me amazing. I'd love to do that. That being said, it's it's just, it is what it is. So since that's not an option, everybody's sort of fallen back to what is the reality, which is great. My question, Steve, is you mentioned bad habits earlier. I would love to hear, because I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this, what are some bad habits that you had to kick? And then what are, what are some just big mistakes people make 
that well, maybe they don't even know they're making. I can give you two that are on me. Okay. Number one is, and I say this, I have a book on networking best practices called the attorney's networking handbook. And I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think the first line of the book for me is no one has wasted more time in networking than I have. So that's how I start. Okay. Because I was, if I went through the math with you, it would blow your mind. Not how, not only how much activity I had, but how many leads and connections and how much karma I was building. It was astronomical how much I was doing. You know what was the problem though? I wasn't getting very much business. So there are books that talk about karma building and networking and all of that. And it's all wonderful. It's all lovely, wonderful stuff. One out of a million people are going to go out there and build the kind of karma I built and actually get everything that's coming to them. And I know Jeremy, you're a big karma guy, but you, you give and you get, and you understand where you need to spend your time and who's relevant to you and who's not. And so I just had to learn some tough lessons about, about, um, how I needed to spend my time efficiently with purpose, meeting the right people for the right reasons. And that's hard to do. I think a lot of people don't have a process around networking. And so they end up killing their time. And I did too, but that was, you know, 17 years ago, not, you know, in 2021. So <laughs> we need to, we need to continue to improve things. And that's one that I can say for firsthand knowledge that I, I thought by helping everybody, the Amway salesman, the insurance salesman, the Avon lady that I was going to do, that I was going to get all this business back because that's what the networking books that I read were saying. The reality is that networking done with intelligence and with intent and with process is always going to trump doing just winging it. That's just never a good plan. And that's what I had to do because I didn't know anything. Now I know quite a bit and everything I do is with intent. So that's one example. The other example, and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a practitioner of my, of my craft. I hire coaches. I've worked with a number of coaches. And one of the first ones that I ever worked with said to me, and this is, goes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago about the agenda, that, um, you know, Steve, you seem to be working awful hard to get what you're getting. And I was a top salesman in, in the franchise space. You know, I was an MVP and I've, I've done, done very well. But the amount of time that I wasted because I was so afraid of hearing the word no, I was so afraid of rejection. And I just, I like to be liked. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, you know, the way I'm built, I, my ego is sometimes not so, so hard and it's hard. People pleaser. Yeah. I'm a people pleaser. That's just how I'm built. And yeah. c- confrontation and, and altercations, that's not my thing, right? I mean, it takes a lot to really trigger me. My 14-year-old has done it a couple times in the last couple of weeks, but that's a different story <laughs> altogether. Masters at that. Yeah. Kids yeah, I have to, an ability. They have a that. remarkable ability. Oh, man. My four-year-old told me this morning he doesn't want me to be his father. I'm like, oh, and it starts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a never ending, uh, you know, body blow and face punches. But exactly. at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we can we can we can work towards it. But the the idea that this, you know, so I worked with a coach and he really was able to identify my gap, which was that I had a very th- heavy pipeline of prospects. I mean, I was doing great at getting people in the door, but then I was dragging. I was selling businesses at the time, franchises. OK, and I was spending a year chasing after someone uh, trying to convince them and sell them and and help them along and get them into this business. And it was never a fit from day one. It wasn't a fit. And if I had figured that out in the first hour conversation, I wouldn't have had to fly back and forth to Minnesota or Des Moines or, or go up to green Bay in my car and spin my wheels for two days, multiple times a year. So it was, it was about that point of, of, of getting to an educational point where you understand if you can, even though you're driving to get sales and you're driving to hit your numbers, that if you're, if you're going down a path that isn't a fit or isn't a win-win and you can call it early for what it is, that's going to be huge in a career. So let's say that you're a lawyer out there and you have all these people you're talking to and it's, it, you're just killing your time. Wow, if you could slim that down and cut that way back to the most qualified people, how much better would it be and how much less time would you spend and how much more billable hours would you be able to get in between your business development efforts? So that's another example of a mistake I was making that I learned from a coach and now I, I preach to the choir as often as I can about efficiency and, and, and knowing versus hoping, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, you know, Steve, you mentioned the the networking and it's intentionally networking. 
and always looking to give. And, and I totally relate to what you're saying there. And one of my favorite books by Adam Grant, uh, Give and Take, and he talks about givers, matchers, uh, givers and matchers. And I, I can't remember the third one, takers. takers and, yeah. um, you know, they say the most successful are givers and the least successful are givers, you know, because of probably what you said, just trying to help everyone. Yeah, it's 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 it, it's it's a very beautiful, lovely concept, right? Of the karma that can be achieved by helping everyone selflessly. And if you have nothing else to do, like that's an amazing thing to do. You should do that. If you have a business to run, or you have billable hours, or you have other things that you have to focus on, we need to give, but we need to give with intention, and we need to then coach people on how to help us. We need to coach people on how to give to us so that they can feel good about it. Because someone that's just taking all the time, if they're really a good person, they're not going to really feel good inside that they've gotten, gotten, gotten from you, but not been able to provide reciprocation. So we need to, to not only coach people um, on, on, on how we can help them, but also how they can help us. And if all that aligns, you're going to be more, much more efficient with how you network and, and actually get to the end result of, oh, I'm in front of a decision maker who can buy my services. So a couple of great tips here. I'll just sum them up and then we'll wrap things up, Steve. But network with intention. Don't be afraid of a no. Try to get to a no. Give with intention. Network, uh, Coach people on how they can help us. I think those are all great tips, great advice, Steve. This has been great. Where can people go learn more about you, Steve, and check out your books? Yeah, so on Amazon, if you type in Steve Fretzen, you'll pull up my three books and uh, feel free to grab a copy, support my son's 529 plan, uh, <laughs> you know, slowly and surely. Uh, then also my website is the best way. It's 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 my last name. It's Fretzen, F-R-E-T-Z-I-N.com. And there you'll understand not only all the free uh, things that I have for you, including eBooks and, and podcast and video and all this stuff. Uh, I've been writing for the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin for five years. But also, if you're interested in learning more about my programs, how do I actually directly engage with attorneys in a variety of ways to get them the results they're looking for? And I can, you know, I'm happy to speak with anybody about that directly as well. Sales free selling. Steve, thanks so much. This has been great. Thank you both. I appreciate having me uh, with you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. Seems like a peach if you find the same. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.